I'd like to thank Harvey Weinstein, um, the Punisher, that's his nickname. The Punisher, yes. We've all seen Hollywood's bright stars and their glamorous lives, but what about their hidden dark sides? Today, we're revealing the hidden troubles of the entertainment world. Number 15, Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby is renowned as one of the world's most prominent entertainers and comedians, but that wasn't what he saw for himself in the beginning. He had initially pursued an athletic scholarship at Temple University. While doing that, he also financed himself by working as a bartender. It was at this point that his relaxed demeanor and witty banter with customers led to suggestions of pursuing stand-up comedy. He followed this advice and soon caught the attention of legendary Carl Reiner. In his early 20s, Cosby made appearances on a variety of renowned programs, such as The Ed Sullivan Show in 1948. His breakthrough came in 1965 when he portrayed Alexander Scott in I Spy. This earned him multiple Emmy Awards for his performance. This was just the beginning. Cosby also enjoyed success in several hit movies, including Uptown Saturday Night in 1974 and Let's Do It Again in 1975. Additionally, he released several comedy albums during his early career. Even up until 1999, Bill Cosby was pretty much active in the entertainment scene, and he also had numerous awards and honorary degrees to show for it. But underneath all of this, a much more sinister story was bubbling. You see, more than 60 women have since accused Cosby of various offenses. More than 60? Isn't that almost unimaginable? In late 2014, numerous allegations surfaced accusing Bill Cosby, an American media personality, of sexually assaulting dozens of women throughout his career. These offenses range from rape, drug-facilitated sexual assault, sexual battery, child sexual abuse, and sexual harassment. Can you imagine that all of these allegations date back to the mid-1960s? And to think that this only gained significant attention following a stand-up routine by comedian Hannibal Buress in October 2014. The jokes had hinted at Cosby's concealed sexual misconduct. So doesn't this mean that some people in the industry were aware of all of these sinister incidents? Whatever the case may be, nobody did or said anything to help the victims, and Cosby kept on building his career and public image. Thankfully, the 2014 stand-up routine subsequently opened the doors for numerous additional claims to emerge. Spanning from 1965 to 2008, and across 10 U.S. states and one Canadian province, Cosby had consistently been abusing women. In the wake of all accusations, Cosby had consistently maintained his innocence and refuted the allegations. One can argue that it was only when the accusations became too big to ignore that numerous organizations began to sever ties with him. His honors and titles have been rescinded. To be more specific, 97 colleges and universities rescinded honorary degrees. In addition to that, the syndication of programs he featured in has also been halted. While most of the alleged incidents fall outside the statute of limitations for criminal charges, Cosby faced criminal charges in one case and numerous civil lawsuits. Gloria Allred represented 33 of the alleged victims, and in July 2015, court records from Andrea Constant's civil suit against Cosby were unsealed. This revealed all incriminating testimonies against him. Following a mistrial in June 2017, Cosby was found guilty at retrial in April 2018 and sentenced to 3 to 10 years in prison in September 2018. However, his conviction was overturned by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court in June 2021. They cited an agreement with a previous prosecutor as a reason for the overturn. Interestingly, despite the ongoing legal battles, Cosby continues to face more and more legal troubles. Most recently, there were sexual assault suits filed by nine women in 2023. Actor Christian Slater arrested for drunk driving On this day in 1989, 20-year-old actor Christian Slater is arrested for drunk. Number 14. Christian Slater Christian Slater was born in New York City on August 18, 1969. His father, Michael Hawkins, was an actor and his mother, Mary Jo Slater, was a casting agent. Since he was raised in a family that worked in the entertainment industry, it's safe to say that his career had already been decided from birth. Slater would accompany his mother to auditions and settings, immersing himself in the entertainment industry from early on in life. Despite all the challenges that came from being thrown into the spotlight from a young age, Slater's love for acting never wavered, even in his battles with addiction and lawsuits. Besides his parents' background and connections in Hollywood, what really made Christian win the hearts of people and rise in the industry very fast was his magnetic and rebellious nature. 
He was famous for his roles in classic 1980s movies like The Legend of Billie Jean in 1985 and Heathers in 1988, after which he earned a place in the hearts of his fans. A few more films that highlighted his skill and adaptability in the 90s were True Romance in 1993, Star Trek in 1991, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves in 1990, and more recently in 2018, Suicide Squad. Although his significant film role, Mr. Robot, was the one that won him a Golden Globe Award for Best Supporting Actor in 2016, he went on to win additional nominations in the following years. In an interview in 2009, Slater mentioned that work is my hobby, staying sober is my job which leads us to one of Slater's many problems, alcohol and drug abuse. Now, here's what the public doesn't want you to find out about this Hollywood heartthrob. Way back in 1994, Christian was arrested when he tried to board a commercial aircraft with a gun in his luggage. After his arrest, he was taken into custody, where he received a three-day community service sentence. Three years later, Slater found himself back in police custody for hitting his girlfriend at the time, Michelle Jonas. He even hit a police officer while under the influence of alcohol, cocaine, and heroin. According to reports, Slater consumed these substances non-stop for the previous two days before his arrest and hardly slept during that time. He was placed on bond and received treatment for 100 days in a rehabilitation center as well as a three-month jail sentence in a residential rehab facility. After his three-month sentence, Christian was freed on account of good behavior. Although off-screen troubles have overshadowed Slater's reputation, new information suggests that he had been concentrating on his sobriety and has continued to work in cinema and television, but with less public recognition than in his previous years. He is currently working on the production of a sitcom titled Unfrosted and an American thriller Blink Twice, both of which are set to release later this year. Till now, Slater remains a respected figure in the entertainment industry and continues to work hard to overcome his challenges hoping to leave a lasting impact in his craft someday. Next, an actor who everyone seems to have forgotten brutally hazed a fellow student. It lets you know that any ad that brings up the concept of cigarettes and health together, well, it's just going to make people think of cancer. Yes. Number 13, John Hamm. Born on March 10, 1971, Jonathan Daniel Hamm is an American actor renowned for his portrayal of Don Draper in the acclaimed period drama series Mad Men from 2007 to 2015. In fact, this was a role that earned him multiple prestigious awards, including a Primetime Emmy Award and two Golden Globe Awards. Hamm has also made a mark in other leading film roles. He appeared in movies like Bridesmaids in 2011, Keeping Up with the Joneses in 2016, Baby Driver in 2017, Tag in 2018, and of course, Top Gun Maverick in 2022. There's a whole lot more, but you get the idea. Considering his impressive filmography, one would be tempted to forget the nasty things he has done as a young adult. At this point, let's back up a bit. The actor was born in St. Louis, Missouri to Deborah and Daniel Hamm, who managed a family trucking company. Raised in the Catholic faith, Hamm experienced early adversity as his parents divorced when he was only two years old. He lived with his mother until her death from colon cancer. Ham then resided with his father and grandmother in nearby Normandy. Having lost his mother at age 10 and his father 10 years later, he effectively became an orphan at 20. Ham's journey into acting began with his first role as Winnie the Pooh in first grade. At 16, he took on the role of Judas in the play Godspell. This sparked his interest in acting, but he initially did not consider it seriously. He attended John Burroughs School in Ladue, where he actively participated in football, baseball, and swim teams. Following his graduation in 1989, Hamm enrolled at the University of Texas. This was when the infamous 1990 fraternity saga went down. While affiliated with the Sigma Nu fraternity at the University of Texas, Hamm would allegedly participate in an almost deadly hazing incident. In November 1990, he was apprehended for his purported involvement in the incident. As testified by the alleged victim, Mark Allen Sanders, Hamm was accused of igniting the pledge's genes, forcefully pushing his face into the dirt and striking him with a paddle. The severity of the incident led to the pledge requiring medical attention. It was so severe that the pledge eventually withdrew from the school. Consequently, the fraternity also faced closure. Sanders later affirmed that Ham was actively involved in the hazing incident till the very end. Ham reached a plea agreement and successfully fulfilled probation under the terms of deferred adjudication. This allowed him to evade a criminal conviction. The charges against him were dismissed in August 1995 upon the completion of his probation. Subsequently, Ham transferred to the University of Missouri. 
He made that transfer while also responding to a theater company's advertisement seeking actors for a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream. He successfully secured a role in the play. This opportunity paved the way for future acting engagements, including portraying Leon Zalgos in Assassins. By the year 2000, he secured the role of the romantic firefighter Burt Ridley in NBC's drama series Providence. Initially signed for just one episode, his contract expanded to encompass a total of 19 episodes. Concurrently, he made his debut in feature films, delivering a single line in Clint Eastwood's adventure movie Space Cowboys in the same year. The rest, of course, is history. Ham has gone on to have an enviable career in Hollywood despite his dark past. According to The Hollywood Reporter, an extensive study of court documents revealed that the lawsuit was dismissed even earlier in 1993. To make this even worse, Ham has reportedly never shown any remorse for his actions. In a 2018 interview with Esquire, Ham's demeanor notably shifted when the topic was raised. Ham rather expressed concern that the discussion might veer into sensationalism and confirmed that he intends to avoid what he perceived was a potential hit piece. When pressed, he then characterized the incident as unfortunate and dismissed it as exaggerated. 2001 Gayhart struck and killed nine-year-old George Cruz with her car after trying to pass a line of vehicles that had stopped to let the boy cross. Number 12. Rebecca Gayhart Rebecca Gayhart was born on August 12, 1971, to a simple family in Hazard, Kentucky. Her dad was a coal truck driver, while her mother was a beauty consultant for the popular cosmetic brand Mary Kay. Developing an early interest in performing arts from a young age, she participated in school plays and neighborhood productions, demonstrating her love for theater. Her family was very supportive of her, so there were no complaints at all when she immediately moved to New York City after graduating from high school at the young age of 15. Before she left her small hometown, Gayhart won a local modeling contest, and this sponsored her relocation to the city that never sleeps, in a bid to seek a career in acting and modeling. All of this happened in 1986. From there on out, Rebecca's career skyrocketed. Casting agencies were quickly drawn to her beauty, raw talent, and persistence, which helped her achieve early success in the entertainment business. She became well-known in Hollywood for not just her appealing looks, but her acting prowess, which she demonstrated in a range of prominent roles, makeup ads, and TV shows such as Beverly Hills in 1995 and Dr. 90210 in 1995. However, it was her portrayal of the cunning and alluring Courtney Shane in the beloved classic movie Jawbreaker in 1999 that made her debut in the industry. Her performance in Hollywood garnered praise from critics and audiences alike. There's no doubt that she was established as a rising star. The late 90s to the early 2000s bore witness to that. But just as her career peaked, darkness loomed closer. Rebecca's career witnessed the most devastating setback. On June 13, 2001, when a nine-year-old boy named George Cruz Jr. died in an automobile accident that involved the shining star. Although it was her co-star from the television show Dusk Till Dawn, Marco Lenardi, that owned the vehicle, Rebecca was the one behind the wheels when the accident happened. The incident took place in Los Angeles, after which the family filed a lawsuit against her, but facts were established that it was an unfortunate accident. The event was widely publicized and Gayhart was sentenced to three years probation, 750 hours of community service, a $3,000 fine, and a one-year license suspension. The aftermath of the event deeply affected Gayhart, who reportedly struggled with guilt and remorse. The family of the young boy filed a wrongful death lawsuit, but she eventually reached a settlement with them and continued to express her remorse to them and the public. Updates indicate that Rebecca has been focusing on her family life and personal well-being. In 2004, she married actor Eric Dane, and the two of them welcomed two beautiful daughters, although in 2018, they both filed for divorce. Gayhart reports that she has taken significant steps to move past the incident, and has even become an advocate for promoting road safety awareness. Despite these challenges, she remains a respectful figure in Hollywood and still receives support from her fans and colleagues. Next, a renowned film producer who sparked the iconic Me Too hashtag. I'd like to thank Harvey Weinstein, um, the Punisher, that's his nickname. The Punisher, yes. Number 11, Harvey Weinstein. Born on March 19, 1952, in the Flushing neighborhood of Queens, New York City, Weinstein is a former American film producer. He was renowned in Hollywood for so long until he was stripped of his title and recognition. Before his crimes would come to light, Weinstein was your average New York kid. He was raised alongside his younger brother, Bob, in a housing co-op called Electchester. He managed to complete his education at John Brown High School and later attended the State University of New York at Buffalo. During the 1970s, 
Weinstein, alongside his brother Bob and Corky Berger, independently organized rock concerts under the banner of Harvey and Corky Productions in Buffalo. Their productions attracted top acts like Frank Sinatra, The Who, Jackson Brown, and even the Rolling Stones. By 1979, Weinstein and his brother co-founded Miramax, an entertainment company that produced numerous successful independent films such as Sex, Lies, and Videotape in 1989, The Crying Game in 1992, Pulp Fiction and Heavenly Creatures in 94, Flirting with Disaster in 96, and Shakespeare in Love by 1998. For his work on Shakespeare in Love, Weinstein received an Academy Award. He also garnered seven Tony Awards for plays and musicals on which he worked. Now, following his departure from Miramax, Weinstein and his brother Bob established the Weinstein Company. He served as co-chairman from 2005 up until 2017 when his evil acts would come to light. Everything changed in October 2017 when sexual abuse allegations dating back to the late 1970s were brought up against Weinstein, and it just kept getting worse. By October 31st, more than 80 women had come forward with similar allegations of sexual harassment or rape against Weinstein. These accusations sparked the hashtag MeToo social media movement and led to subsequent allegations of sexual abuse against numerous influential men worldwide. This led to a phenomenon now known as the Weinstein Effect. We imagine this was not the kind of impact Weinstein hoped to leave behind. As expected, this wave of accusations resulted in the swift removal of numerous powerful men from their positions of authority in the United States and beyond. Much to everyone's delight, Weinstein faced dismissal from his company and even expulsion from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Following these allegations, Weinstein was also suspended from the British Academy of Film and Television Arts. He was allegedly forced to resign from the Directors Guild of America. Considering how fast the industry was in cutting lies with Weinstein, wouldn't it be safer to say that they want you to forget they had anything to do with such a monster? It wasn't just Hollywood. He also faced condemnation from prominent political figures with whom he had previously supported. Even his own family kept their distance. Earlier on October 10, 2017, his wife, Georgina Chapman, publicly announced her decision to leave him. But it wasn't until July 2021 that their divorce was officially finalized. The Los Angeles Police Department initiated a criminal investigation into all the allegations of rape. Similarly, the authorities in New York and London began probing other claims of sexual assault. In May 2018, Weinstein faced arrest and charges of rape in New York. By February 2020, he was convicted of two out of five felony counts. He was subsequently sentenced to 23 years in prison and began serving his term at Wendy Correctional Facility. By July 20th, 2021, he was extradited to Los Angeles to face additional charges in a separate trial. On December 19th, 2022, he was found guilty of three out of seven charges in the Los Angeles trial. Weinstein has since received an additional sentence of 16 years in prison to be served independently. Actor Mark Wahlberg wants to be officially cleared of a 1988 incident in which he hit a Vietnamese man in the head with a wooden stick and punched a second Vietnamese man in the face while trying to steal alcohol from a convenience store. Number 10. Mark Wahlberg Mark Wahlberg was born on June 5, 1971 in Dorchester, Boston, Massachusetts. His father, Donald Edmund Wahlberg Sr., was a U.S. Army veteran of the Korean War in 1950, and his mother, Alma Elaine, worked as a bank clerk. Reports reveal that Mark experienced many obstacles and misfortunes as a child, including run-ins with the law and involvement in street violence, all while growing up in a working-class neighborhood. However, he found joy as a teenager in becoming a member of the hip-hop group Marky Mark and the Funky Bench. He and his friends enjoyed making musicals, as they all found comfort and meaning in it. Sometime in the late 80s, Calvin Klein was drawn to the young musician and model because of his charisma, raw talent, and passion. This launched him into the spotlight as he began a lucrative modeling career, but that wasn't before he had gotten himself involved in a number of questionable activities that came back to haunt him. In Hollywood, Mark eventually transitioned from singing to acting and soon carved his name amidst other talented and lucrative actors. His role in movies such as Boogie Nights, Three Kings, and The Departed brought him much attention. He proved to be a versatile actor dabbling in different genres ranging from comedy to romance and action. In his career, he has been nominated for two Academy Awards and three Golden Globe Awards. Mark won one of the two nominations for his role in The Fighter in 2011 and Boogie Nights in 1998. Other movies that he is famously known for as a major role from the early 2000s are Planet of the Apes, Ted, and Transformers. Although Mark continues to make waves in the film industry, revelations of his dark past brought about a wave that almost destroyed him. As his career peaked in the mid-2000s, reports from his past began to resurface, after which he lost many fans and supporters. 
the famous heartthrob had a criminal record, which included racially motivated assaults and hate crimes committed in his youth. In June 1986, Wahlberg, then 15 years old, went after three black kids, hurling rocks at them and screaming, kill the nigger, kill the nigger. This might have been termed child's play at the time, but later when he turned 16, he beat up a middle-aged Vietnamese American man on the street using a big wooden stick. This event happened in April 1988. Witnesses say that he kept calling the old man a Vietnam effing shit and rendered him unconscious before he stopped hitting him. Later that day, he punched another Vietnamese American, Tony Trinh, in the eye. When he was first arrested, it was for attempted murder. Due to his violation of the former civil rights injunction he was granted in the past year, during which he was charged with two charges of assault and battery with a deadly weapon, one count of possession of marijuana, and criminal contempt. After entering a guilty plea to the felony assault, he received a three-month jail sentence. According to recent reports, Mark Wahlberg is still doing well in Hollywood, juggling his acting career with business endeavors and philanthropy. He has remained active in charitable work, which includes helping at-risk youngsters and advocating for educational programs. Even though his previous wrongdoings are still being investigated, the actor reiterates his commitment to self-improvement in every interview. The actor's anticipated movies are Arthur the King, The Family Plan, and new parts of a former franchise, Uncharted. Next, the first filmmaker to face imprisonment due to a film-related fatality. Say, but we're trying to make a movie here. As if that somehow outweighed the safety or the welfare or the business of other people. It was like Number 9. Randall Miller There is no doubt that Randall Miller is a multi-talented American filmmaker. He has also served as a director, producer, screenwriter, and editor. He would also tag himself as an occasional actor. Born on July 24, 1962, Miller was initially inspired by the medical careers of his parents. While he began studying biochemistry, he would later discover a passion for acting. Following this passion, he made his way to featuring in TV commercials, theater productions, and also making appearances in various television shows and films. He later transferred from UC Davis to USC Film School and later to the AFI. His thesis at AFI led him to the path of Ed Zwick, who offered him the opportunity to direct episodes of 30-something. This launched his directorial journey, and he continued to gain momentum while doing so. Later in his 40s, Miller delved into independent filmmaking. Investing his own resources to helm and produce Marilyn Hotchkiss, Ballroom Dancing and Charm School in 2005. This was an expansion of his 1990 short film, but it shot him to new heights. This endeavor was followed by independent productions like Noble Sun in 2007, Bottle Shock in 2008, and CBGB in 2013. Notably, Miller achieved critical acclaim, particularly for Bottle Shock. Interestingly, this was a project he self-distributed and financed. A risky move to most, but we believe it just goes to show that he believed in his sauce. You would think that he was on his way to having the most enviable career in Hollywood until the fatal accident that he caused. By 2015, Miller made history as the first filmmaker to face imprisonment due to a film-related fatality. The tragic incident occurred because the director went ahead to film on the tracks without proper authorization. Despite lacking permission, filming continued, and this led to the death of Sarah Jones, a dedicated camera assistant working on the film Midnight Rider. Following her tragic death, the movie remains unreleased. She had died while valiantly making an attempt to remove a mattress from the track to prevent a potential train derailment. According to The Hollywood Reporter, the accident took place in Wayne County, Georgia. The cast had been filming a dream sequence for the Greg Allman biopic on the tracks. When they saw the unscheduled train coming, the crew made efforts to clear the area. However, they were unable to remove a prop bed from the tracks in time. The Georgia police confirmed that Sarah Jones had died instantly. This incident did not just spark a legal battle, it also catalyzed the safety for Sarah movement within the film industry. The sad truth is that there are many out there like Randall Miller. The working conditions for crew members mean absolutely nothing to some directors and producers, so long as they can take advantage of cost-cutting measures over safety precautions. In 2015, Miller opted to plead guilty in connection with the train crash that claimed the life of Sarah Jones. His decision aimed to spare his wife from incarceration so she could stay home and care for their two children. As part of his sentence, Miller was to serve one year in jail and also receive 10 years of probation. During those 10 years, he was prohibited from directing films. By 2019, Miller disregarded the terms of his probation by participating in the filming of a movie titled Higher Grounds. This action was rightly viewed as a violation of his probation conditions. Miller and his legal team had argued that the probation terms were ambiguous. 
Miller claimed to believe that he could oversee a film if someone else assumed responsibility for safety measures. But for some reason, the judge refrained from sending him back to jail and only sternly cautioned him against directing any further movies. Classic Randall Miller is trying to cut corners again, wouldn't you say? He's like fondling me and, um, and that's like my first memory of when the abuse started and, you know, eventually it progressed over the next five years. Number eight, Victor Salva. Born on March 29, 1958, Victor Salva is an American filmmaker and a convicted sex offender. Born in Martinez, California, Victor was raised in a religious home as a Roman Catholic with his mom, siblings, and stepfather. In an interview, he recounted that his stepfather was physically abusive and an alcoholic, who abandoned their family when he was only a boy. When Salva came out as gay to his mother at the age of 18, his family rejected him. As a teenager, Salva was very interested in horror and science fiction films. His favorite show as a child was Black Lagoon. In 1975, a local paper published that Salva had seen Jaws 55 times. By the time he received his high school diploma, Salva had written and directed almost 20 short and feature films and worked two jobs during the week to support his hobby of filming. In 1995, Salva wrote and directed the highly regarded film Powder. It told the tale of an outsider albino child with extraordinary abilities. After Powder, he moved away from the horror genre and filmed the more introspective film Rites of Passage, which did not go over well with reviewers or audiences. The reason why his movies were doing poorly at the box office was partially attributed to the allegations of a 12-year-old kid whom Salva had assaulted and who called for a boycott of the picture, which happened a few years earlier. Salva was convicted as a child molester and admitted to it in 1988. He had five felonies related to having sex with a boy whom he recorded in an intimate setting. After police officers raided his apartment, they found videotapes and magazines containing child pornography. He pled guilty to all the charges against him, including indulging in oral sex with a 14-year-old boy and procuring a child for pornography. He was sentenced to three years in prison, of which he only served 15 months, but got a lifetime registration as a sex offender. After being released, Salva's career took a break. He didn't work on a movie for almost three years. Now he is currently back at work producing movies. His most recent series, Jeepers Creepers, was a huge hit in theaters. His last project was writing, producing, and directing the third Jeepers Creepers movie in 2017. Next, a glorified actor and media personality who died without answering for any of his heinous crimes. What does she do with the cable, boys? Number 7. Jimmy Savile What can we say? Jimmy Savile had it all. He was born on October 31, 1926, and lived a seemingly clean and fulfilled life until he passed away on October 29, 2011, at the age of 84. He was a renowned English media personality, actor, and DJ. Many people grew up watching him host popular BBC shows, such as Top of the Pops and Jim Will Fix It. As an actor, he showcased his talent in productions like Fairy Cross, The Mercy in 1964, Go-Go Mania in 1965, and When Lewis Met Jimmy in 2000. Throughout his lifetime, Savile was a prominent figure in the United Kingdom. From his quirky persona to his extensive charitable endeavors, you could almost say he was known and loved by all. He actively fundraised for various charities and hospitals. Some of the notable beneficiaries of his philanthropy include Stoke Mandeville Hospital in Aylesbury, Leeds General Infirmary, and Broadmoor Hospital in Berkshire. His philanthropic efforts have earned him a knighthood in the year 1990. He truly was a celebrated man, but revelations following his death in 2011 would paint a starkly different picture. You see, numerous allegations of sexual abuse surfaced shortly after his death. As you can imagine, it prompted public outcry and widespread scrutiny. The whole saga blew up in October 2012. An ITV documentary delved into the allegations, and it triggered a wave of media attention and an influx of witness statements and more abuse claims. Scotland Yard initiated Operation U-Tree, a criminal investigation to probe the accusations of all child sex abuse implicating Savile. According to reports, his sinister activities had spanned six decades. The investigation led the police to determine that he was, in fact, a predatory sex offender. The investigation also ranks him among Britain's most prolific sex offenders. Authorities pursued over 400 lines of inquiry across 14 police forces. It was determined that he abused 450 people. As if it couldn't get more vile, you'll also learn that 328 of them were minors. 
In June 2014, inquiries into Savile's actions at 28 NHS hospitals, including Leeds General Infirmary and Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital, revealed that he had sexually assaulted individuals aged between 5 and 75 over many years. All those philanthropic acts were just a show, a facade to hide his true nature and also make his evil desires a whole lot easier to access. Consequently, some of the honors bestowed upon Savile during his career were posthumously revoked. Even his television appearances, such as episodes of Top of the Pops that he hosted, were no longer aired. But wouldn't you say that over 400 victims are wild? How could this have gone undetected for so long? The truth is that there were allegations during his lifetime, but sadly they were often dismissed, as accusers were either ignored or disbelieved. Two police investigations considered reports about Savile during his lifetime the earliest known being in 1958, but none led to charges. Sporadic allegations of child abuse were made against him later in 1963, but these only gained widespread attention after his death. To make this even more infuriating, his 1974 autobiography As It Happens, which was reprinted as Love is an Uphill Thing in 1976, actually contained some admissions of improper sexual conduct. Again, this went unnoticed during his lifetime. This monster was truly hiding in plain sight and never got to answer for his crimes. Inspired Woody Allen's daughter Dylan Farrow to give her very first television interview in which she talks about her allegation that she was sexually abused by Allen when she was a child. Number 6. Woody Allen Originally named Allen Stewart Konigsberg, Woody Allen was born on November 30, 1935 in Brooklyn, New York. He is an American filmmaker, actor, and comedian whose career has spanned over six decades. He was raised in a Jewish family, and despite their conversations, Allen became fully immersed in the vibrant and dynamic of New York City. From early on, he showed a gift for writing and a love of humor. He would often amuse his family with sketches and jokes, finding comfort and inspiration in books he would read and movies he watched. Although he suffered a tumultuous relationship with his parents growing up, he found solace and escape in the world of cinema and literature. Woody Allen started out in Hollywood as a comedy writer, writing jokes for stand-up routines and television shows. Eventually, he made the switch to filmmaking, starring in and directing his own unique brand of smart and erotic comedies. With movies like Annie Hall, an American rom-com from 1977, which took home four Academy Award nominations for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Original Screenplay, and Best Actress, Allen received a lot of praise for this timeless piece, and that cemented his place as a major player in American filmmaking. However, being in the spotlight brought his private life under heavy criticism and intense scrutiny, particularly when it came to his love relationships. In the early 1990s, accusations of sexual abuse against his adopted daughter, Dylan Farrow, came to light. The claims, which Allen fiercely disputed, caused a stir in the public and sparked disagreements among insiders in the industry. When the allegations were made against him, he was in a 12-year relationship with his wife, Mia Farrow, with whom he shared three children. Only one of them was biological, while the other two were adopted. The allegations against him began a few months after his wife Farrell learned that Allen had also had a sexual relationship with one of their adoptive daughters, Soon Yi Previn, whom he later married in 1997, five years after the first allegations against Dylan. The whole saga caused a stir in Hollywood as it was unheard of, and it painted Allen as a child molester, although he cleared up the accusations, reiterating that the relationship he shared with his stepdaughter was consensual, and they only consummated it when Soon Yi came of age. Two investigations subsequently cleared his name, and the charges were revisited in 2014, but currently the case is still open, and investigations still ongoing. Although the deed has already been done, a negative shadow still remains cast upon Allen's reputation and his professional career. It is reported that some actors and collaborators distanced themselves from him, although there are others that still continue to support him and his work. His fans, on the other hand, are faced with the polarizing topic of separating the art from the artist and his private life. Popular shows you might have heard of that were written by Woody are Midnight in Paris, which won the Golden Globes Award for Best Screenplay in 1986 and 2012, and also an Academy Award for its originality in screenplay Annie Hall, which won Best Academy Award in 1978 for Best Directing a few amongst several of the many awards and nominations his work has received. In conclusion, Allen's contribution to cinema is undeniable, and his prolific work has left an indelible mark on the industry. However, these allegations have marred his legacy, and is still an ensuing controversy. On a list full of predators and sex offenders, up next is an accused cannibal. A few months of good times? Hmm? Were they even that good? I swear, looking at you now makes all the fond memories go sour. Number 5. Army Hammer 
Armand Douglas Hammer was born in Los Angeles, California to Drew Ann and Michael Armand Hammer. His father is a businessman who is linked to the notable tycoon and philanthropist Armand Hammer, who led Occidental Petroleum for decades. And one thing a rich kid can afford to do, you guessed it, leave school during the 11th grade and pursue a career in acting. But for some reason, he eventually took courses at Pasadena City College and UCLA. Rumor has it that his parents insisted on it. After a series of minor roles, he actually gained recognition for his portrayal of the Winklevoss twins in the 2010 film The Social Network. He has since starred in films such as Death on the Nile, The Man from Uncle, and Call Me By Your Name. Everything seems PG, right? Well, not for long. The first personal challenge that hit Hammer was the separation from his wife in July 2020. However, subsequent allegations of disturbing fantasies would emerge in early 2021. In January 2021, an anonymous Instagram account released several text messages that contained very disturbing sexual fantasies. The account claimed that Hammer had sent these messages to different women. Of course, he denied the authenticity of the messages and referred to them as an online attack. His legal team even took action by seeking messaging records from Meta to clear his name. This would prove futile, but more disturbing truths to be revealed were on the horizon. All through January 2021, additional women stepped forward. Each one alleges Hammer's involvement in elaborate BSDM and cannibalistic fantasies. One woman asserted that she had been in an on and off relationship with Hammer. She then recounted to the New York Post his emotional abuse and expressed a desire to cook and consume one of her ribs. She also disclosed having to attend a PTSD hospitalization program due to the aftermath of the toxic relationship. Another woman, who claimed involvement with Hammer, recounted that he had branded the letter A on her, intentionally left her bruised, and often discussed consuming her. As you can imagine, his attorney was on standby to counter the claims. His legal team insisted that all engagements with any individual or any partner of his were fully consensual, openly discussed, and mutually participatory. They also cited a 2020 podcast where the same woman had spoken positively of Hammer following the end of their relationships. Despite the accusations, Hammer was never formally charged. In April 2023, the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office disclosed an investigation into all allegations of sexual assault against him. Insufficient evidence was cited as a reason for the closure. Still, Hammer remains a cannibal to many. Hammer had actually been ousted from several film projects following the allegations. Judging by how quickly Hollywood execs did away with him, they certainly would not be casting him in projects anymore. If you've made it this far, do hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so you won't miss any updates from us. First time ever, the woman raped by Roman Polanski when she was 13 has just appeared in court. Yeah, she was asking an L.A. judge to drop the case against the fugitive director. Number 4. Roman Polanski Born on August 18, 1933, Roman Polanski is a French-Polish director and actor. The stage of Hollywood has witnessed him receive multiple awards, including two Academy Awards, ten César Awards, two Golden Globes, and a British Academy Film Award. For his innovative writing and directing roles in films that include, but are not limited to, the horror thriller Rosemary's Baby in 1968, Chinatown in 1974, The Pianist in 2003, and Oliver Twist in 2005. All of this appeared to be the pinnacle of the celebrity's career, yet in 1977, it started to suffer a rapid decline. Originally born in Paris to Polish-Jewish parents in 1933, his parents moved away from France, relocating their family to Krakow, Poland, Central Europe. When Nazi Germany attacked the city two years later and World War II was ushered in, the family found themselves imprisoned in the Krakow Ghetto, a settlement just outside their province. Robert's parents, who were Jewish, were taken prisoner during the raids. As a result, he had to hide his heritage under a false identity in order to escape the Holocaust, after which he was raised in foster care. Robert, as a lone survivor, spent an isolating youth being transferred from foster home to foster home until learning that his father had also survived the Holocaust and the two reunited in Poland. He began training and acting in 1950, and the same year, he made his feature debut, which was largely about his life and survival during the Holocaust. His career in Hollywood began with short films, and soon after he moved to France, he produced and directed several films and gradually acquired notoriety in Hollywood. On March 11, 1977, Robert was taken into custody, just three years after he made Chinatown, for the alleged sexual assault of Samantha Gailey, a 13-year-old. The young girl participated in a Vogue photo shoot as a model for him. Numerous Hollywood executives flocked to his aid after he was charged with six counts of criminal behavior, including rape. In Samantha's testimony, the young girl recounted how the scenario played out. 
She remembered that when he requested her to lie down on a bed, she started to feel uneasy and talked about how she tried to fight against it. I replied, no, no, I'd rather not enter that space. No, this is not what I want to do. We were alone, and I didn't know what else would happen if I made a scene, she said, adding, I didn't know what else to do after that. I was just afraid, so I resisted a little, while before deciding, well, I guess I'll get up to go home after this. Polanski underwent a 90-day mental assessment after entering a guilty plea to the accusations brought against him, which included unlawful sexual act with a minor, rape by use of drugs, perversion, sodomy, lewd and lascivious act upon a minor, and furnishing a controlled substance to a minor. He was freed after 42 days, but he subsequently found out that the magistrate handling his case had informed a few of his acquaintances that he would reject Robert's plea and give him a minimum of 50 years in prison. A day before his court appearance, Polanski left the country for France after discovering this. He has been living there ever since he was granted protection from extradition as a French citizen. It's been more than 40 years since his self-imposed exile. Next, an actor who had not been drinking but killed two women because he chose to drive in the wrong lane. And that would be handing out guns to a thousand colleagues. Number 3. Matthew Broderick the American actor was born on March 21, 1962 in Manhattan to Patricia and James Broderick. Both parents were involved in the arts, so his path as an actor came quite easily to him. Broderick received his grade education at City and Country School and then went on to Walden High School, all in Manhattan. Later on, he honed his acting skills at HB Studio. You might remember him from his roles in iconic films like Ferris Bueller's Day Off or as the voice of adult Simba in Disney's The Lion King. These are just two of his impressive credits so far. There is no doubt that Broderick has made significant contributions to the entertainment industry. In recognition of his achievements, he was honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 2006 and inducted into the American Theater Hall of Fame in 2017. However, we can't forget the fact that Broderick took the lives of two young women so carelessly on August 5, 1987. That day, the actor was involved in a fatal car crash accident in Northern Ireland. While driving a rented car, he collided head-on with another vehicle, resulting in the deaths of 28-year-old Anna Gallagher and her 63-year-old mother, Margaret Doherty. Broderick sustained serious injuries, including a fractured leg and ribs, a concussion, and a collapsed lung. His passenger, Jennifer Gray, also suffered severe injuries. Sadly, his victims were not so lucky. Despite facing charges of causing death by dangerous driving, Broderick claimed to have no memory of the crash. Furthermore, Broderick was not confirmed to be drunk but still, he could not explain why he was driving in the wrong lane. He was ultimately convicted of the much lesser charge of careless driving. Even worse, he was only fined 100 pounds, which is approximately $175. The victim's families could do nothing but express disappointment with the verdict. To describe drama, drama is life with the dull bits cut out. Number 2. Alfred Hitchcock Sir Alfred Joseph Hitchcock was born on August 13, 1899. Before passing away on April 29, 1980, at the age of 80, he was a revered English film director. In fact, he is still widely acclaimed as one of the most impactful figures in cinema. Over his illustrious six-decade career, he helmed more than 50 feature films. Many of them remain enduring classics. Renowned as the master of suspense, Hitchcock's fame rivaled even that of his actors. Interesting, right? This fame was bolstered largely because he granted numerous interviews and made iconic cameo appearances in most of his works. Throughout his career, Hitchcock gained a reputation for grappling with Hollywood censors and frequently challenging the constraints imposed by the Hayes Code that governed the content of films. He was constantly devising new strategies to circumvent these regulations. You can already see how this showcased his inventive approach to filmmaking, right? However, Hitchcock's portrayal of women in his films has drawn scrutiny. Let us consider iconic scenes like Tippi Hedren's harrowing encounters with gulls and ravens in The Birds and Janet Leigh's chilling shower scene in Psycho. With scenes like this, questions were constantly raised as to what the director's attitudes and motivations towards his female characters were. Speculation abounds that Hitchcock's films served as conduits for his personal desires and fixations, particularly concerning women. Tippi Hedren's revelations for her 2016 memoir have since fueled this perception. She alleged sexual assault and other misconduct during the production of films like The Birds and Marnie. By detailing instances of harassment and retribution from Hitchcock following her rebuffs, she shed light on the darker aspects of their professional relationship. 
Despite her commendable performance under Hitchcock's meticulous guidance, Hedren reportedly endured genuine trauma during the filming of the birds, particularly in the infamous attic scene. Assured that only mechanical birds would be used, she found herself confronting live birds when it was time for filming. This not only heightened her distress, but also highlighted the complexities of her collaboration with Hitchcock. She described the grueling experience of having birds hurled at her as brutal, ugly, and relentless. Crew members, including Hitchcock, expressed remorse over the ordeal. Hedren particularly noted Hitchcock's difficulty in facing the situation, as he secluded himself in his office until the shooting was imminent due to his discomfort. However, she later understood that Hitchcock's actions were driven by a desire to exert further control over her. She recounts instances where he shared inappropriate stories and jokes and attempted to kiss her forcefully in a limousine or office. He also invaded her personal space throughout the production. All of these actions she found intolerable. Critics of Hedren's account argue Hitchcock revered women and prided himself on gentlemanly conduct. However, could she really have made it all up? Lastly, because nice I will tase her if necessary. Number one, Dan Schneider. Daniel J. Schneider used to be a household name. That is until a whirlwind of accusations came knocking at his door. Born on January 14, 1964, Schneider hails from Memphis, Tennessee. There he served as the senior class president at White Station High School. Post-graduation, he briefly attended Harvard for one semester, but eventually enrolled at what was then known as Memphis State University. It was during this time that a movie producer spotted and invited him to audition for a role. This ultimately kickstarted his journey in the entertainment industry. He then relocated to Los Angeles, where he juggled roles as a pizza delivery boy while pursuing more acting opportunities. His breakthrough came in 1985 when he landed the role of Ricky Smith in Better Off Dead. It was at this point he ventured into writing and producing. From the 1980s until 2018, Schneider amassed a prolific portfolio in the entertainment realm. He notably excelled in family and children's television, particularly under Nickelodeon. Some of his most notable creations include Good Burger, All That, The Amanda Show, What I Like About You, iCarly, Drake and Josh, Zoe 101, Victoria, Sam and Cat, Henry Danger, and Game Shakers. Sadly, underneath the success of his works lay a well-hidden secret. Everything came to light in 2018, and Dan Schneider has since been the subject of extensive media scrutiny and controversy. There have been just one too many allegations of inappropriate behavior and other misconduct. In response, Nickelodeon promptly severed ties with Schneider and ended their long-standing partnership. Wondering how serious these allegations were? Well, reports surfaced about Schneider's conduct, alleging a long-standing issue with temperamental outbursts and the questionable posing of young actresses' feet. In 2013, he sparked controversy by using the official Sam and Cat Twitter account to solicit pictures of feet from minors under the guise of a contest. An internal probe has also revealed instances of Schneider verbally abusing his colleagues. Some described him as challenging to work with and prone to tantrums and hostile emails. By August 2022, Insider published fresh allegations, including claims of gender discrimination and requests for massages from female colleagues. A source close to Schneider acknowledged his remorse over the inappropriate massage requests. Russell Hicks, a former Nickelodeon executive, refuted allegations of sexualized scenes in Schneider's shows. He asserted rigorous oversight by parents and caregivers on set. Later in 2024, a documentary series tagged Quiet On Set shed more light on Schneider's alleged toxic workplace behavior at Nickelodeon. Again, he apologized for only aggressive and misogynistic conduct, but contested the other accusations of sexual misconduct toward the child stars. Familiar with any other faces of evil in Hollywood? Do let us know your thoughts in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like button. You also can't miss the next video on your screen.